Um, in order to make sure we can maximize our time, we'll go ahead and start. For anyone who is just joining us, please, um, if you are comfortable doing so, add your name, preferred pronouns, and profession or affiliation to the chat. And if you have any burning questions, you can add them now or as we move forward. And we're going to address questions at the end, but we'll do our best to integrate any questions or comments um, as we um, as we go on. Thanks for starting to add your stuff. Um, my name is Rebecca Gudeman, and I'm an attorney with the National Center for Youth Law. I work on health-related advocacy, and I'm joined today by Elizabeth Estes, who is a lawyer with Atkinson Andelson Lawyer Red and Romo, and does education work. She represents, um, or her, her firm represents a number of districts, and um, I'll let Elizabeth um, introduce herself a little bit more when she, uh, she jumps on to talk to us about FERPA. Um, today, we're going to start by addressing sort of the big question that people often have, are you HIPAA or FERPA? Then we'll cover um, the basics of HIPAA, basics of FERPA, and move to frequently asked questions. Um, and because we're lawyers, Elizabeth and I, and we like to say stuff like this, we want to remind you that this is legal information, not advice. And so unfortunately, there may be some questions we just can't answer. Um, and I put this photo up. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've been watching a lot of old TV and reruns and Good Wife is one of those um, law, law, cheesy law shows that are really fun to watch if you haven't, if you're running out of shows um, right now. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and jump right into are you HIPAA or are you FERPA? Um, and, and really the question is what, which confidentiality law controls access to the information or records um, in the school-based or school-affiliated clinic that perhaps you're working with or working um, uh, for? Um, we know that county and community health clinic employees generally must follow HIPAA. Uh, we also know that the records of school employees are generally subject to FERPA, but when we start getting into school-based health and mental health care, perhaps um, relationships between these outside agencies working on school sites, um, it can get a little fuzzy or people feel confused. So that's what we want to talk about right now. How do, we, um, how do we figure out sort of which one might, uh, might apply in what cases? So the first thing to highlight is that it is not possible for a health record to be subject to both FERPA and HIPAA at the same time. Um, there is no way. So it's, it's one or the other. Um, and that's because the HIPAA regulations explicitly state that its rules do not apply to health information um, that are held in an education record subject to FERPA. So if FERPA applies, HIPAA does not. Um, so the key question um, when you're trying to decide which record applies is, uh, is this one. Is the originating health provider, the person who is creating that information, an educational agency employee or an agent of one? So what does that mean? Like a school nurse, for example, someone hired by the school district working in the school district, that is an educational employee and the records created by a school nurse would be subject to FERPA. Um, somebody working at a children's hospital, not employed by a school district, working in that hospital system is not an educational agency or an employee. Um, but what happens when we've got a children's hospital sending staff to a school um, and perhaps the school is uh, providing some funding, perhaps um, the school has created the clinic and directed the kinds of services that will be delivered. That's where um, the federal departments of health and human services and the department of education have said, we need to really look on a case by case basis at that relationship and look at some of these factors operational and administrative control over the services uh, being provided and the staffing, um, the services and functions being provided. Are these services that are traditionally provided by a school or is this something well beyond what we might see a school doing? Um, also look at financing. And depending on sort of the combination of factors, um, it may tip one way or another. 
Um, so there are some examples that the de two departments have provided. You might have, for example, a county Department of Health employee go to a school district and provide vaccines. Um, that is something that is being provided on a school campus, but in every other way, the funding for it, the control over that employee is uh, under the county system. Therefore, the records created would be subject to HIPAA according to the federal agencies. Um, by contrast, maybe you have a school nurse who is in every way playing a traditional school uh, nurse role, but some of the funding for that school nurses position is being provided by some outside funding, maybe from a uh, foundation. In that case, that the school nurses records would still be subject to FERPA. So it really depends um, very much individually um, what, what, how you sort of balance all of those variables. And there are some case examples in this joint guidance from the two federal agencies. Um, but this is something that we really recommend folks touch base with their own legal counsel and management to help them assess those factors if they're in somewhere sort of, it feels blurry. Now, sometimes when we do this, folks say, oh my gosh, this is really hard. Can't we just create an MOU and say, you're going to be HIPAA and you're going to be FERPA and that's it. Um, and the answer is not really. A contract can't override federal law or federal regulations. So if all the legal factors align to make it clear that FERPA or HIPAA should apply, then that's what we got to follow. We can't change that by contract. Um, that said, it can be really helpful in a contract or an MOU to lay out your understanding of which one applies um, to, to which records and to um, which employees, um, because this really can help develop the relationships and uh, set up a good scenario for information sharing moving forward, which is why we really recommend to the extent possible to work with legal counsel um, uh, upfront when you're setting up a school shared school based health um, situation. So why does it matter so much whether you are, your records are subject to HIPAA or FERPA? Well, there's a lot of practical impl implications. It can impact a parent's ability to access records about their health care delivered to their child. Um, and we'll talk more in a second about what HIPAA and FERPA actually say, so you'll see what that is. Um, it definitely impacts if you are providing any kind of minor consent related care. Um, it will change whether school staff can access records or providers outside of a school setting. Um, it changes um, public health reporting rules and administrative rules. Um, just as a few examples, if someone is providing services and is subject to HIPAA, there are a number of administrative obligations um, for uh, covered entities, that's what you call a provider who's subject to HIPAA, including disclo creating disclosure logs, having notices of privacy practices, um, administrative safeguards you need to put in place for record keeping, and, and rules for the kind of uh, uh, authorization to release information, sort of what it needs to include. That's just a few examples. Um, in the same way, if records are subject to FERPA, there's some specific obligations, including annual notices, um, local policies and definitions, a different kind of disclosure log, and different rules for release forms, as we'll talk about. So it does matter um, at sort of the broad level and down to details. Um, so th that is sort of a really quick overview of the HIPAA or FERPA. We do have some more detailed information available in something called the HIPAA or FERPA primer. And that primer is now available um, and the information in it through a website on the California School Health Alliance um, webpage. Um, so we encourage you to take a look at that and it includes sort of an algorithm to help you make some um, answer questions about sort of which way am I? Am I an educational um, agent or employee of one? It goes into a little bit more detail. Um, okay, so with that, um, and I see some folks are starting to send in questions. Great. We're going to keep track of those and we will get to them, um, try to get to them as best we can at the end or integrate answers um, uh, as, we, as we move forward. Um, but now I'm actually going to shift to do a, a basic overview of HIPAA, and then I'll pass it to Elizabeth to talk about FERPA.
Um, so when we say HIPAA, we often say HIPAA, but in fact, in California, we're talking about a package of laws. We're talking about at the federal level, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, but California has its own statutes. And HIPAA, notably, what it says is, here's sort of the basic rules that apply across the United States, but if your state has any more specific laws, laws that are more protective, you need to follow your state laws. And California is one of those states. Um, so uh, one of the big laws that we need to make sure we're complying with here is called the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act here in California. And there are some others that apply based on funding stream or type of services. For example, if you're providing HIV related services, there may be some special laws that apply or um, services funded through Title X funding, which is a federal funding stream for certain family planning related care, for example. But um, as a general matter, what we're gonna talk about today is HIPAA and state law. And the important thing to take away is that often when we're saying HIPAA, we're also including this California law and what we're doing in California may look different than what folks are doing in Arizona or Nevada or Massachusetts because we are also trying to comply with California law. So it's not possible to just take a template for a release form, for example, from a sister state, um, school-based health programs in a sister state, um, because their form may need to look a little different than ours because of our California rules. Um, so when we talk about HIPAA, there's actually a HIPAA privacy rule and a HIPAA security rule. And I just mentioned that because the security rule is about online records, um, electronic health records. And now as we're doing more telehealth, it is relevant to know that there are rules tied to how we share and um, protect information as we're doing things electronically. But the substance of the privacy rule, sort of how we protect and who can access records is in the privacy rule. Um, it, all, it applies to personally, personal health information. That means individually identifiable health information that's transmitted by electronic media, maintained by electronic media, or transmitted or maintained in any other form. Um, and the HIPAA privacy rule does does sort of this broadly. It protects the disclosure of personal health information and says to healthcare providers, you're not, as a general rule, allowed to disclose that unless you have written authorization um, in order to share it. And that written authorization, we'll talk about what that needs to look like and include in a second. Um, that said, there are exceptions in HIPAA that allow providers or and in some cases require them to share information even when there isn't that written uh, authorization in place. So let's just talk about that authorization because that's really the gold standard. If you have an authorization in place, then you can share information and know for sure that you are uh, within the appropriate uh, guidelines and it really helps create um, a system where everybody knows um, the provider, the family, the patient, um, who's getting what, when, and how. Um, in order to make sure your authorization is compliant, it needs to conform with both HIPAA and California law. That includes having, for example, an expiration date. It can't be a compound document, meaning that the same signature is to, for consent to the service and release of information and insurance. You need to have a separate signature just for the release of information. Um, it needs to describe um, the purpose for the release, who, who um, you're sharing it with and um, the information that, that they're allowed to share. And notice it also has to have 14 point font. That's a California rule. 14 point font is really big. Um, that's important though. We need to make sure that we're complying um, when we go to the effort to actually get that signature. Um, it also needs to include a number of specific notices, um, which most of us have seen in our own personal life, um, and it's pretty easy to track down, but just um, something to make sure that you don't forget, because that sometimes happens. Um, so who signs that authorization? In California, and this is California law, a minor patient must sign that release if the records you're looking to disclose relate to services that a minor consented to or could have consented to under the law. 
In other cases, it would be the parent, guardian, or other legal representative. So typically that's a parent, but if you have a young person who's living with their grandparents or living in foster care, there may be somebody else who would be signing it. Um, if, in terms of minor consent law, you can find a summary of all minor consent laws on this chart, which is available on teenhealthlaw.org. But as a quick um, reminder, um, there, uh, it includes pregnancy-related care for minors of any age. It includes mental health services at age 12 or older if the minor is able to participate intelligently in the minor consent services. Um, it includes um, substance use treatment at 12 or older, et cetera. Um, and I see a question asking if there's a standard expiration date time. Um, there's neither HIPAA nor California law requires you to put, uh, you know, for example, one year or less. And sometimes people ask, can we just have them sign a release that will last for the four years that they're in high school or all the years they're in elementary school? Um, in theory, yes, but the trick is that every release needs to be a meaningful release. And so sometimes the question is, if, if a parent is signing a release when their child's in kindergarten and now the child's in fifth grade, um, and the types of services that they might be um, delivering, or you know, let's say they're in seventh grade now, and maybe we're talking about um, some more sensitive information. Would the parent say, "I remember signing that release that long ago, um, and that I really didn't en envision that it might include some of the things here"? So that's that's the kind of question that it's really important to bring back to your own lawyer and administration to under, to sort of make a judgment call about what makes sense given the population you're serving, um, the families you're serving, the types of care you provide, et cetera. Um, okay, so just as a practical example, Joey is nine, he's receiving mental health therapy from a private cl clinician in the community. His parents want his therapist to talk to Joey's teacher in order to help the teacher understand what support Joey needs in class. May the therapist talk to the teacher based on the parent's verbal permission or oral permission. Um, and if a written authorization is necessary, who would sign it? So again, our general rule is we cannot disclose information without a written release. There are some exceptions to that, but in this case, um, the private clinician would need a written authorization in order to be able to have that conversation with Joey's teacher. Um, if that written authorization is necessary, who signs it? Joey is nine. Joey is not able to consent for his or her or their own care at this point. So the parent, uh, guardian, or other legal representative would sign that release form. Um, now, if this were a telehealth situation, sometimes folks say, well, can we use electronic signatures for HIPAA? HIPAA itself doesn't address that, but what the Federal um, Department of Health and Human Services says is that because there's no specific standard in, uh, in HIPAA, you, just, you can use electronic signatures. You just need to make sure that it's a, a, um, the way that you're doing it follows any applicable state or other law. And the most important um, laws to be aware of uh, related to electronic signature at the federal level are the eSign Act and the UETA, Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. And those just put in some basic uh, rules around making sure that there's some user authentication, that there's some integrity in the signature. There are more and more programs available now that help you meet these standards. And I think Elizabeth might talk about it a little bit in her um, section. I'm looking over at her little video to see if she's going to nod or not. <laughs> um, but just want to flag that it is possible to use electronic signature for um, HIPAA releases and just work with your team to make sure that you're meeting these um, sort of administrative standards. Um, now, as we said, our gold standard is a rele written release, but that's not always possible. There are a number of exceptions in HIPAA that allow you to share information without that release in place or require it. Um, I'm just going to talk about a couple that are most relevant um, in the school um, share information sharing setting. Um, so let's start with the, the first one with a case. Uh, Liam and his parents have a telehealth appointment with his pediatrician to discuss recent headaches. Liam's parents mentioned he just started taking some new allergy medic 
medication provided by Patty provider at a local clinic, but they can't remember the name of that medication. The pediatrician wants to reach out directly to that clinic. What, if anything, may the clinic tell the pediatrician? So our general rule is that they would need a written release in order for the pediatrician and the clinic to communicate. But there is a relevant exception in HIPAA in this case. Um, there is an exception under both California and, and HIPAA law that allow healthcare providers to share uh, information with other providers of healthcare and, and healthcare professionals for purposes of diagnosis or treatment. So that would mean in this case, the pediatrician and the clinician could communicate and discuss Liam's situation in order to help provide the best care possible to Liam. A couple of caveats. Um, HIPAA does say they need to know that they're actually talking to another provider of care. So they could implement certain standards. Some people say, fax me um, a form that shows your letterhead or show me something. Maybe I know you because we work together a lot. So I recognize your voice or I recognize your email. Something needs to be in place to know that you're actually communicating with another healthcare provider. And this isn't an aunt or uncle picking up the phone and pretending to, um, in order to try to get information. Um, the other important thing to know is that this is um, allowed but not required. So your agency may put in place provisions that say, even though we're allowed to do this, we're still going to ask for written release. And let's say you're a, a, a clinic that provides particularly sensitive health care. Maybe you provide mental health care or reproductive health care. Um, and you know that for a relationship with your uh, patients, it's really important that the patient knows you're you're going to really protect their information. Um, it's okay to put in place your own um, internal rules that say we are not going to answer a phone call from pediatrician in this case until we get that permission from the appropriate person. Um, but it is important to know that that's your decision. It's not something that HIPAA is requiring of you. Um, okay, I know I went through a little quickly. There's some questions that have been coming in. We're going to get to those in the end, but right now I'm going to pass it to Elizabeth to talk about FERPA. Okay, so I want to um, get into FERPA. I um, am an attorney who works with the public school districts in California, um, and Rebecca and I have sort of partnered on this, um, which is incredibly helpful because both of us operate uh, within HIPAA and within FERPA, but um, sort of in different parts of the world, um, as she works with a lot of the providers in the healthcare space, and I work with a lot of education in the education space. Um, so I want to get into FERPA. We can go to the next slide. Rebecca's going to control the slides for me, I think. Um, so what is FERPA? So, so FERPA is sort of the Corollary Information Privacy Act um, that controls the public, all the public schools and um, entities in California. It's intended to protect the privacy of educational records um, and at the same time, assure parental access to records. And it governs educational institutions and agencies um, and it can include organizations that contract with or consult with educational agencies via contract as a provider for the educational agency. And I'll talk um, a little bit more about that. Next slide. So what information is protected under FERPA? So what is protected is it's, it's not unlike under HIPAA. In some ways, it's any information directly related to a student. So it has to be directly related to a particular student. It has to be maintained by the educational agency or institution or by a person acting for such, for such agency or institution. This does include IEPs um, and testing and evaluation um, that we do in the context of uh, special education evaluations. Um, it includes health records like nurse, nursing records and other pupil health records. So those uh, would be governed by FERPA. Um, next slide. What is not an education record? There are some exceptions to what is an education record. Oral communications and personal impressions. This is a records law, so it governs records. 
Um, it governs records of instructional. No, it does not include, there's an exception for records of instructional supervisory and administrative personnel that are left in the sole possession of the maker, which are not accessible to any other person except a substitute in the school. And oftentimes people will say to me, oh, this is a personal record. This is an exception to FERPA. You know, I'm keeping this private. But when I spend more time with them about that record and who that record may or may not have been shared with, um, oftentimes it has been disclosed to other people in the school setting. So this is a very narrow exception, but it is designed um, for someone who is uh, providing services to maintain um, sole possession of records, except if they're, um, and it would still be exempt, even if, unless they, if it is a substitute that they're being shared with. Records of a student that are, oh, go back, sorry. I just wanna get into, records of a student who are 18 or older, made by a physician, psychologist, or other health professional, and used in connection with provision of medical treatment. And then here we have the primer referenced again. Um, both Rebecca and I were involved in the development of that document and that website, and I think it is helpful for people trying to answer these questions related to HIPAA and FERPA and records. Okay, next slide. What is the rule? So FERPA prohibits educational agencies from releasing any personally identifiable information in our record without written consent. Um, and again, that written consent has to include certain elements to be valid. Um, I actually suggest that everything go into 14 point. I don't know what Rebecca thinks of that, but um, I sort of think that um, that is best practice as we're developing our consent to release documents. But like HIPAA, there are some exceptions under FERPA to sharing of information. So let's go to the next slide. Um, we can, I want, both Rebecca and I feel strongly about always reiterating that we can always share with identified recipients with a valid written authorization to release. And otherwise, it's only if there's one of the exceptions that I'm going to talk about. So best practice in any situation is to have informed consent to release information amongst the people who are going to be sharing information on some sort of a school-based team. Um, that really is, is best practice. And one of the things I will say that comes up regularly, I think for both of us, is that services start to be provided on a school campus um, with some sort of contractor or partnership with some other health entity. And no decision is made up front before the service begins regarding whether you're HIPAA or FERPA governed, um, and regarding what information you are or are not going to share with one another. And so I regularly field phone calls that really are um, a challenge to information sharing. Somebody wants to share something and someone else doesn't want to share it or won't share it. Um, and those sorts of questions should be asked in advance of the service even being provided so that there's clarity on what the information sharing is gonna look like, what's gonna be shared, and also so that in any sort of informed consent to release information, you can incorporate the people who are gonna be sharing information. Next slide. So what are the exceptions that we were talking about? So in an educational context, um, there is a, an exception for information sharing for those with a legitimate educational interest. Those with a legitimate educational interest in the education setting can share that information. That includes school employees and it can include contractors um, and consultants that we have contracts with if we have notice in our local policy that we have defined them as school officials and if they comply with FERPA regarding the use and disclosure of the information. But that definition incorporating contractors into school officials has to be included in our public notices. Um, the other thing that I'll say about legitimate educational interests is that oftentimes people will say, well, 
I have a legitimate educational interest in this confidential information, health information, um, because I work at the school. And that broad um, sort of concept of having a legitimate educational interest is really not um, where the law, what the law is contemplating. The law is contemplating that there is an actual reason why the person who is seeking this information needs it in order to perform their duties um, in the school setting for the students in the school. And sometimes people will say, well, I should have access to everything because I want access to everything. And that is not a legitimate educational interest. There has to be an actual reason why. There are many, many staff on school district campuses that will never have any contact with some of the students on that campus. And so having unfettered access to their confidential information is not necessary. So that's just something that we need to be thinking about and talking about um, as we're designing our information sharing practices on school campuses. Other exceptions are, oh, go back. I'm gonna do the other exceptions. Health and safety emergencies. If we get a court order for information sharing, um, there is a mandated reporter child abuse reporting exception that um, always applies. Um, and then it, and then we can share directory information um, like names and addresses um, of students that is a very limited amount of information. And there are others, but these are the most primary ones that come up in the um, FERPA context and in the school setting. Okay, next slide. Elizabeth, I, I'm going to add one thing because a question came in asking about sharing records when a student transfers and that is one of the exceptions as well. Um, so if you could just really quickly mention that. So if, if someone's moving from one school to the next and the, they're asking, for example, for the immunization records from the prior school. Yeah, well, we, when there are statutes on point when a student is transferring in, and registering from one school to another that we need to be transferring their educational records to the new institution that's going to become the responsible local educational agency. And that, and there is a specific exception in FERPA that allows you to do that without needing written um, yep. release from the parents. Yep. Um, and that transfer goes on between the two LEAs, between the two educational institutions. Um, so there's no exception to the definition of education record. We wanted to mention for records used to submit reimbursement claims to Medicaid for students that are Medi-Cal eligible, um, nor is there any exception to the written consent requirement in FERPA. And this came out of a decision related to Medicaid billing and FERPA. So the claim form that we might utilize to bill Medi-Cal for services for students can only be shared if we have parent prior consent to share that information um, for purposes of that billing. For students with IEPs, that consent is actually embedded on the IEP form in California. At the base of the form, it says, I give consent to bill and share information for Medi-Cal. Um, with the expansion of Medi-Cal billing in the schools, um, and there is a new state plan amendment that expands uh, LEAs, school districts, um, billing option program for students, not just IEP students, but non-IEP students, we're going to start to see more billing um, from the schools for Medi-Cal eligible services. Next slide. So who signs the informed consent um, to release parents for students under 18 years of old under FERPA um, and the student transfers rights transfer to students um, when they're 18 if they're 18 or older um, whose parent so parent is defined as natural parent guardian individual acting as a parent in the absence of a parent or a guardian next slide so we just wanted to talk a little bit about a case um, in accessing school records just to give you an example so we have andy he's 11 and he's been receiving mental health counseling through a school-based health clinic. 
Um, and he also receives occupational therapist uh, therapy services from the school through his IEP. So the health clinic clinician would like to communicate with the school's occupational therapist about Andy's progress and see Andy's IEP evaluation. So, so we asked a couple questions. Can the occupational therapist speak with the clinician? Can the school give access um, to the information? And is there any way for the clinician to get access to that information? And this is sort of an interesting hypo for me, um, and I'll let Rebecca jump in here too, but, but because when it says school-based health clinic, um, for me, in my practice, I do a lot of school, Rebecca, show you, I do a lot of school wellness development, and um, there are federally qualified school-based health centers, um, and so, and they're, they're often run um, on school campuses, but they are HIPAA governed and run by the County Behavioral Health Department in, in, in partnership with the school district. And so those um, requests for information sharing are often coming to us through HIPAA and the HIPAA requirements that Rebecca is talking about would apply to those situations and we would need a release. Um, in order to share that information um, with the clinician, um, for the occupational therapist to share that information with the clinician under HIPAA. I guess, Rebecca, you can jump in here, but if we were looking at the exception for um, consultation with relation to treatment or arranging additional treatment, um, one might say, you know, the reason why they're reaching out is to do that. Um, but I, as Rebecca knows, I'm a proponent of informed consent to release when this sort of outreach happens between um, like county behavioral health providers or community-based providers and, um, and education. You wanna add anything to that part? And then I'm gonna move to FERPA. Well, I think that's the, the million dollar question is this, school-based health center clinicians records are they a covered entity operating under hipaa or is this a, an agency whose records are subject to ferpa and perhaps someone who is a consultant to the system because if it's all within the ferpa world there's more opportunity as you just said and exceptions for legitimate educational interests to perhaps share information without needing that release even if a release is a gold standard but under HIPAA, if this is a like a, a, the county or someone who clearly is under HIPAA, they would need that written release um, in order to share anything with that outside clinician um, and then, you know, make sure you know who needs to sign that and that it's a compliant release. But go ahead and talk about the FERPA, sorry. Yeah, so if I swip, flip over to this being like a school-based health um, center or clinic and it's FERPA governed, um, then we flip over to the FERPA analysis. And that brings me to, is there a legitimate educational interest in sharing this information? And to be honest, just because um, there is a clinician working with a student uh, who wants this information, doesn't necessarily mean to me that there's a legitimate educational interest in sharing that information between these two providers, although there may be. If the clinician feels like they really need to understand um, you know, what is occurring within the confines of the occupational therapy or they're seeing some sort of comorbidity of, of need um, for that particular student and they feel like they need access to these records in order to really provide the most effective treatment possible, then I think that there would be a legitimate educational interest. However, I go back to, we would still in that situation need to have defined, if this is a contractor, need to have defined um, school official as incorporating that contractor. And in a best practice world, in my practice, when I'm working with the schools in building out school wellness continuums, I would have already had an informed consent executed when the student began their clinical services to say, 
these, the, this information sharing may occur between these other providers who are working um, with the student in this team, um, this multidisciplinary team, so that you have clarity on consent to the information sharing that's going to be taking place. So that's, in my opinion, and always best practice. And there are forms and documents that are generated for that um, in many of the school-based wellness continuums um, that we're running in California now. Um, Before and that we move on, there's a few questions that sort of relate, I think, to this case that I just want to flag. There's, uh, for example, a question about um, if a, how much information a school nurse can share with the teacher, especially if it's mental health or sensitive information or from a, a nurse in one school to another school when they transfer. And there's folks who are saying, well, is it a violation of HIPAA? Is it disclosing too much? And this is where it is so important, and I'll pass it to Elizabeth, but so, so important to remember what we said up front about it can't be HIPAA at, or and FERPA at the same time. So when health information is in that school file, FERPA treats it the same as it does grades or you know attendance records or things that we may not feel as sensitive. And that's really important to know if you are someone who's um, a school district employee that um, it doesn't have that same level of protection. But Elizabeth, as a practical matter, I think this ties to what you were just saying about sort of when you're doing that, how, what would be your advice on how much someone um, discloses? Yeah, so in most all of our, um, in most all of our data systems in the schools, we have like privacy protections um, and certain people who can access certain records. And one of the questions that coming in, coming in is, the amount of information that's then shared with a school nurse. I think if a school nurse thinks that they need the information in order to provide treatment to students that they're working with, um, that, you know, that, 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 then that information could be released to the school nurse. I have had circumstances where people have said, I need everything in a student's, and all this, I need everything in everybody's file, you know, and out of 2,000, children on a school site and we may have i don't know how many nursing staff or it might it might be a, a, a assistant principal who's saying that for all the students on campus even though their alphabet is a to e and they're never gonna have any contact with the rest of the population um and in those situations i think the requests um just are not warranted for unfettered access so I'm hoping that answers that question. This does sound like uh, a nurse is making a specific targeted request for information um, so that they can provide uh, care to an identified student. Um, so let's see. Um, let's see, I, I'm just looking at some of your chats. Are we, Rebecca, do we have more slides? I don't. Uh, we, I just moved forward. we have a couple, maybe we could uh, quickly go through the next few slides about telehealth and best practices right now, because I think there are a couple chat questions related to that, and then we can um, get to some of the other questions in the chat. Okay, so I just, this, this nursing school to school sharing of information, I'm not, so that there's a reference here to a HIPAA violation and if we're talking about school nurses in a school setting who are school employees providing school-based nursing services, then we're FERPA governed. So that's, a, I guess I would be asking that question. Um, and in a transfer of records, um, the nursing records would be transferred. So I would, you know, so that information should be coming. Um, okay, so I think, I think that answers that question. All right, let's get into um, best practice in informed consent and treatment in telehealth under FERPA and related California law. And as we, as we go, I'm realizing um, there is a lot to cover here. And you should definitely be working with your, with your attorneys uh, related to uh, practices and protocols. And once you have your practices and protocols in place and everybody's understands them, 
um, it, it really does make provision of these like wellness continuums much easier on everybody. So, okay, next slide. So notice the parents of privacy rules and limitations. So we are all operating, um, you know, in some capacity within the confines of tele support to students. Um, and so we have created and um, advised the districts to provide notice to parents of privacy rules and limitations. So that means providing written notice to students and parents, advising them of the limitations of privacy when we're providing telehealth services, um, the limited expectation of privacy vis-a-vis -vis like our ability to monitor online activity or activity in anyone's home. This is often embedded now, at least for us um, in our practice in, a, in the LEA's annual parent notification. Um, and we can put information in there regarding privacy, regarding expected participant behavior when they're receiving services um, uh, via remote platform, and also a legal prohibition against recording and the consequences for failure to abide. It is against the law in California to uh, record someone without their consent. Next. Best practice for maintaining confidentiality, um, informed consent to treatment. So we wanna have informed consent to the telehealth treatment that we're gonna be providing. Um, we wanna remind our participants that they should be in a confidential space without distraction or access to others. Um, we want to notify them that the session could be discontinued if there is a breach of confidentiality during this, the session and again of this recording provision. Next slide. Can I use text, video, or phone when I provide school services? Um, telehealth services can be offered within the FERPA governed system as it can within the HIPAA governed system. FERPA is gonna control any records that are generated um, during the course of that treatment. So consumers and parents should be notified of information sharing practices as we've talked about through informed consent to treatment and release of information. And you need to be thinking about what records are being generated in the, this context and whether those are gonna be maintained in the regular course of business. And if they are and are identifiable to the pupil, they're subject to FERPA, those records. And we get a lot of questions about what about the records that we're keeping like in a computer as we're providing services. Um, and those, assuming you are providing services and codifying information related to um, treatment of the minor that you would be codifying if you were in person, but you're doing this remotely, and then those are gonna become education records um, if you're maintaining them in the regular course of business. So they're gonna be FERPA governed records subject to everything we've been talking about. Next. Oh, next is um, that we're back to that primer and I think to um, Q&A, but I do encourage you to go to the School Health Center um, website for information and also just, and when you're working with attorneys, be sure you're working with attorneys that have experience um, with HIPAA and FERPA when you're, when you're figuring all of this out because um, it is a very specific sort of area of law and practice. So next slide. So that is it. And I think we can start going to some of the questions in the chat. Um, and Elizabeth and I will start trying to read through them. I, uh, one that I saw had to do with um, mental health clinicians coming on campus or being asked by the school staff to inform the principal when, if the clinician is making a child abuse or police report on, uh, related to a student. That's a really, really common question and practice. Um, 
if you are a clinician working on a school site, but you are clearly under HIPAA, your rule, your information is subject to HIPAA and California Confidentiality of Medical Information Act. What HIPAA says is you need a release of information to share with anyone unless there's an exception. There's an exception for child abuse reporting that allows you to share information with CPS or the police, but it does not allow you, that exception doesn't allow you to share with others that you have made that report. So if you are working on a school campus and you make a child abuse report, HIPAA does not allow you to tell the principal, I made a report on Susie Q today about ABC. Um, that said, it's really understandable why a principal might want to know that the police might be showing up and asking to interview someone. So we have seen um, folks come to agreements about how they might flag, for example, for a principal that police might be showing up without requiring them to disclose personally identifiable information that would be a violation of HIPAA. And it's a great example of why it's so important up front to have those conversations. So the, because the worst case scenario is you move into a situation, police show up, principal is mad that you didn't disclose and it creates a hostile situation um, because people didn't understand that in the first place. Um, Elizabeth, do you have uh, any follow-up or another question? Uh, yeah, I mean, my follow up would just be mandated reports are supposed to be confidential um, reports and everyone has an individual obligation to report, um, meaning you don't tell your boss and then, you know, expect your boss to make the report. Um, but, but there are ways to share that there are concerns with relation to our particular student without disclosing that you've made a mandated report. Um, and so those are the sorts of protocols, you know, that we have created on school sites so that the people who need to know um, that we think that there's a danger to that particular child um, know, know it. So if the police do show up, it isn't a complete surprise. Um, okay, so here's a question which I think you sort of covered, but let's answer it explicitly. What rules apply to COVID screening, Google Forms, Google Docs, and emails between school-employed staff about student concerns related to health? With telecommunications being the main mode of communication, are there restrictions on the platforms we can use to convey this information? So, yeah, so this actually goes into a whole other training that um, Rebecca and I just did and um, it relates to actually the uh, Children's Online Protection and Portability Act and some other cal uh, laws related to uh, the transfer of information online. When you are contracting with other intermediaries like Google or other, um, you, you need to be making sure that they're complying with um, the information, the Children's Information Sharing uh, Protection Acts um, so that they are compliant with those laws. And like I said, we just sort of, that in fact, I think the School-Based Health Alliance did a whole other training on, on those laws as well. Um, so that when, when you're asking about like third party intermediaries, but the other thing that I would say is to the extent you're generating documents and your information sharing um, about personally identifiable students, um, then you know, that the people that, if it's in the school context and it's FERPA governed, the people that are sharing that information need to have a legitimate educational interest in that information. Um, and in my opinion, you should have like a best practice consent for your multidisciplinary team regarding the information that you're sharing. Um, this, this question though, I mean, I can imagine many hundreds of fact scenarios that I would be talking to clients about related to any given Google doc. Um, the, uh, there's a question I'll just answer quickly. You mentioned font size of 14 point, but what font type Times Roman versus 
Arial look different. Pippa does not say which font type, it just needs to be 14 point font. But it's a great example where I like to say just because it's not in the law, that doesn't mean you can't go to your end users, the families or kids and ask them what's easier to read for them. Um, creating documents with those end users together will mean that everybody understands, you can know that they understand it and that it's a knowing release and it makes everybody feel better about it. Um, so I'm not sure, this is a little bit off, but there's a question, Elizabeth, can schools ask or require documented results of a negative COVID test for, test for staff or students to return to campus? And a related question about if someone says they need a medical exemption to wearing a mask, can you ask for more details about what that is? We can ask for more information related to uh, medical exemptions for masks. Um, Absolutely, if we feel like we need that information um, in any given circumstance. We can also ask for like a, a, a COVID test um, result. Uh, however, we may end up in a situation where we have a family that says, you know, I'm not interested in sending the actual result. I am, get, you know, I'm informing the school district that we've received a negative test and complying with the provisions actually that we've created in all the school districts that say, you know, no one is going to send their child to school if they, you know, meet a bunch of different criteria, not the least of which is they have a fever or they have symptoms or clearly a, a COVID positive test. Um, so this is a question I think it's really important that we, you can find more information in the primer and we usually have it, but this is a shorter session. In the cases of suicidal ideation and or threat to self or others, the notification to school staff is critical for care and follow up with the child. Um, we didn't mention it, but there is an exception in HIPAA and an exception in FERPA for emergencies so that it, um, in HIPAA, and I'll let Elizabeth address FERPA, but in HIPAA it says, um, if you think that there is an imminent threat or risk to somebody, you are allowed to connect with whoever you think might be able to mitigate that threat um, in order and, and share information without needing that release. So it might be sharing with a parent, maybe it is sharing with a principal. It doesn't mean sharing with anyone, but it gives the professional the judgment call to decide who needs to know. And you can find the specific language for that exception in the primer. And Elizabeth, same thing in FERPA, but go ahead and... and. I would just say the same thing in FERPA. I mean, we have like limited time. Um, I, yeah, I think it's the same. Um, I was just looking at, we've been told that information coming from another organization should be summarized and then shredded. Is this correct? Um, for purposes of FERPA, a, a decision has to be made what information you are going to maintain in the regular course of business in the student's records. Um, and if you are forwarded something that you're not going to maintain, you know, in the student's records um, and you're creating an additional FERPA governed record in order to do that, um, then yes, I mean, you could, you could return the record to the original sender um i guess would sort of be my thought but you could you could also um not maintain the record as a course as a part of your um as a part of your process in developing a, a pupil records file there are a lot wow we, we need I like think, another unfortunately record. we're not going to be able to i think we get kicked off right at 1 30 we won't be able to get <laughs> all these questions we want to encourage you to look at the website because some of these questions can be answered um, from the information in the primer. Um, and apologies that, it, you know, so for example, there are exceptions for disclosure of information around public health on um, reportable conditions, but you should look at the language of that exception, which we talk about more in the primer. Um, and uh, it, you can ask follow-up questions after that once you've taken a look at that. I, I'm sorry we didn't get to answer everyone's questions. Several questions about we're sort of hybrid in the middle. Um, we wouldn't have been able to tell you whether you're HIPAA or FERPA, but um, great question sort of piecing apart those uh, variables that we talked about and that's what is, you need to bring back to legal counsel. Uh, Elizabeth, final wisdom? 
Um, no, you know, really that it is complex and there are a lot of fact scenarios that present themselves and they're going to increase these um, questions as we create more school-based health, which is going to happen um, in coming months and years. So I, I do encourage you to really work your way to an answer with your administration and the attorneys that you're working with and then create set protocols that you all understand and can utilize. Um, many of these questions come up over and over again. Um, and so I just really encourage you to create practices and processes that everybody is trained on and everybody understands. All right, thank you everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you.